It is Z690 month. Welcome back to the channel, guys. I hope you're keeping well. So today we're gonna to be looking at the MSI Z690 Carbon Wi-Fi Gaming Motherboard. Now, when it comes to motherboards, it's all about its ability to bring out the best in the components that you're putting into it. So for that purpose, I want to tell you exactly what is in this test build that I did. Starting off with the CPU is the Intel 12900K, which is obviously the 12th gen CPU. The PSU is an FSP800, 150 watt gold. The SSD is an MSI M390 one gigabyte. We have got two 16 gigabyte modules of Kingston Fury 4800 megahertz, that's DDR5. For graphics, we've got an MSI RTX 3070 Ti Gaming X. For cooling, we've got a MSI Core Liquid 360 millimeter AIO. And encompassing everything is the Antec DF700 Flux case. Now, I would like to thank Ubisoft for sending over the code for Assassin's Creed Valhalla Ragnarok. And this is not only because this is a perfect benchmarking game, especially with regards to graphics, is because there's something called Mystic Light, which Ubisoft and MSI have been working together on. So I will explain that a little bit more, but what it has to do with is the game actually enacting with the RGB of the entire PC and the keyboard and the mouse so something to look forward to in the review so we will be looking over the design of the motherboard the specifications of the motherboard obviously the performance of the motherboard but as is normal let's look at this unit a little bit closer The overall design of this board is really good looking and is solid as one would expect from MSI. The PCB has limited flex to it which means putting it into any case is going to have a firm and solid feel to it. The thermal design is extremely aggressive as you can see towards the top of the board the MOSFET heatsink is very enlarged, the IO heatsink is very enlarged. Looking at the bottom of the board you can see the entire south bridge of the motherboard is covered which is good but does present an issue. Now, if you are looking to reset your BIOS, you are going to have to take out your graphics card and you're going to have to take off that heat shield. Now, that could have easily been avoided if MSI had just put a BIOS reset button, which one would expect of a board that is more of a gaming and enthusiast board. So a little bit of a slip up from MSI on that design feature. The dims were a little bit stiff for me, kind of like putting on jeans that you haven't worn in quite a while when you're sitting on your bed and you're really trying to get them on. I was honestly scared at a point that I might break the PCB of the dims from the RAM, but it did click in in the end. So just something to note on the dims. Further, the dims were not reinforced and on call it lesser boards, I have seen reinforced dims. So just something that I also wanted to note because I think that MSI could have reinforced those dims. So even though the dims are stiff, there is a redeeming factor and that is something called SMT or surface mounted technology 
technology. So if you turn over any old motherboard, you'll actually see that there are soldering points all along that. And what SMT does is it puts those solder points with inside the layers of the PCB, which reduces defect as well as electromagnetism. Even though the dims are stiff, I do see that as a nice redeeming quality. Overall and concluding on the design of the board is we do have a really solid board and a good looking board coming here from MSI. But the two things that I would like to see fixed is that dim stiffness as well as having a CMOS clear button. Specifications give you pretty much everything that one would need or want on a Z690. Obviously it's an LGA 1700 which means that when next gen launches you are safe there. The RAM can overclock to 6666. I haven't been able to test this yet because I don't have RAM capable of hitting that speed yet so as soon as I do I will be testing that out. Moving on to the connections. So the PCIe's the first two are PCIe X16 and that's version 5. 5.0 so you are next gen safe there. The third one is 3.0. On the NVMEs there are five. Now the first four are version 4.0 and the fifth is version 3.0. There are also six SATAs that come in at six gigabytes per second or gigabits per second rather. On connectivity, we have a 2.5G LAN, so no 5G LAN, but that wouldn't be expected on a board at this level, but we do have Wi-Fi 6E, so we do have the latest Wi-Fi. I'll show you all the input outputs and USBs on a graphic now, but the one thing that I do want to mention is that the rear USB-C is USB-C 3.2 Gen 2 X2, which is 20 gigabits per second, but the frontal is X1, which means 10 gigabits per second. So this is something that I do give a little bit of stick to manufacturers when they don't put a X2 uh, on the frontal because a lot of chassis are or do have the ability to have that throughput. So that is just the first call it negative on the input outputs. Overall, the specs do leave little to be desired, but the one change that I would like to see is obviously the Gen 2 X2, or for me, even a Thunderbolt. I really do promote Thunderbolt because of all the devices that I test, but this might not be something that you require. But on the NVMEs, the M.2s, I would have liked to have seen one of them being a 5.0. Because there are five NVMEs, we could have maybe just sacrificed one or two and had one of them at 5.0 so that is next gen ready but the x16s are next gen ready so there are two 5.0s so you can do that in crossfire so if those changes were made i would be a lot happier because excuse the pun but it is almost a carbon copy of the z590 with the obvious changes on the x16 being a 5.0 now we move on to performance. So there are two things that I want to note before we move on to performance. One, this is actually my personal rig that I tested it with. So there is bloatware or a lot of programs. So that could have, it actually didn't, inhibit the performance. And also when it comes to overclocking, not really, but I did install the MSI profiles in which I did put it to performance mode. So all of the results that you're seeing are not with true overclocking or actually pushing any of the components past what they are meant to do. So we're gonna start off with Cinebench. Starting off on single core performance, we hit a score of 2006. Now the rest of these scores are derived from CPU Monkey and I took all of their results verbatim. So we outperformed and hit a score that is nine higher, theirs being 1997. For reference, I put the 10900K, the 5900X and the 5950X so that you can actually see the comparative results, but good result coming in straight up on a single core performance. Multi-core performance, Again, we hit a score of 27,580 as compared to the 27,472 from CPU Monkey. Then again, we have the 10900K, the 5900X, and the 5950X for reference. So again, outperforming the relative scores. Now, Blender has changed the way they do benchmarks. It's not time-based anymore, it is score-based. So we hit a score of 377.49, and the median from their test results, it is still very new, so this does have to be tested in a couple of months time again, but the median was 356.27, so this hitting a higher mark. Again, we have the 10900K, the 5900X, and the 5950X for comparative results. Benchmark temperatures, nothing new here. We have seen that the 12900K does hit 
high temperatures on rendering, but in Blender we hit a max of 97 with an average of 75. In Cinebench Multi we hit a hundred on max and 86 on average. And then on Cinebench Single Core Performance, obviously 62 on max and 34 on average. Gaming performance, you can see at the bottom where Formula 2021 was at 4K on Ultra. Now these are the average FPSs. So we hit a average FPS of 72, a minimum of 60 and a max of 82 in Formula One. On Assassin's Creed Valhalla Ragnarok 4K Ultra settings, we hit a average of 53, minimum of 25 and a maximum of 149. Now in order to stress the CPU a little bit more. I downscaled Rainbow Six Siege to 1080p in Ultra in which we still see amazing scores coming out of an average of 509, a minimum of 386 and a maximum of 682. So I redid the test from Valhalla just shutting down a couple of call it unnecessary programs so you can see the benchmark coming in here from Assassin's Creed Valhalla Ragnarok and we have an average of 54, a minimum of 38 and a maximum of 162 at 4K Ultra. Moving on to the gaming temperatures, at the top you'll see the indicator, blue being CPU average, red being CPU max, gold being GPU average, and green being GPU max. Formula One again at 4K Ultra, we hit a average of 45 on the CPU and 59 on max settings, which is actually insane if you think about it, with the GPU being a 76 on average and a 78 on maximum GPU. Onto Assassin's Creed Valhalla, and this was Ragnarok, we have 43 on CPU average, we have 56 on max. On the GPU, we have 73 average and a 76 max. On Sid Meier's, we have the 4K as well. This was at 4K Ultra. We have 50 on average, 65 on max. This is a game that's obviously a little bit more CPU dependent. We have 71 average on GPU and 74 on a GPU max. Moving on to the AI render from Sid Meier's Civ 6 at 4K Ultra. We have 49 on average for the CPU. We have 70 on max. The GPU is hitting a 77 average and the GPU max hitting a 78. Lastly, on Rainbow Six Siege, as expected at 1080p Ultra to put more stress on that CPU, we do have an average of 52 on the CPU and 82 as a max. The GPU average is down on 67 on average and the GPU max being 72. On to SSD performance. Now I was using the M390 from MSI. So what it promises is a read of 3300, but I actually achieved 3451. On write, it promises 3000 and I achieved 3193. The IOPS were disappointing, but this can be attributed to a bloated system, which it hit 224 or 224,000 on read as opposed to the 420,000 possible and on write 191,000 as opposed to the 550,000 possible. Just some extra information for you and this is the RAM at base. We can see good read, good write, good copy and good latencies. The latency relative but this has obviously got to do with the RAM itself but we are getting good scores for read, write and copy with regards to 8 64 on a memory benchmark. So to show what this motherboard's PCIe lanes were capable of in relation to the 3070 Ti, I used 8 64 GPU benchmark. So I'm not gonna go over this because this is a lot of information to digest, but we do have good read, good write, and good copy coming out of the graphics card, as well as Julia Mandel showing good representations of what the graphics card is capable of. So this motherboard taking the full complement of the 3070 Ti. On to features, and the only feature that I'm gonna talk about is Mystic Light. So at first I really thought, okay, this sounds very gimmicky, because what Mystic Light does is it synchronizes your RGB with the game. And in order to do this, you literally go to MSI Center and you'd say Mystic Light on, and then you would go into the game and you'd say MSI Mystic Light on. And in this case, it is Assassin's Creed Valhalla Ragnarok. Now, the obvious things are when you're getting hurt, your entire system goes red, and I'll show you that in a video 
in front of you now. When you're healing, it's going green. And then when it's loading, it's just doing different things all the time to kind of give you an immersive experience. So I thought this was going to be gimmicky. It actually is quite cool. But the thing that really, really impressed me was the keyboard. So when starting a new game, you really don't know which keys to press. So WSAD was illuminated in a goldish yellow, obviously letting you know that these are the movement keys. But what was more impressive is the entire keyboard was non-illuminated except for the keys that you would use. Now, when changing the key binds, for example, if stab was J and you wanted it to be K and you go into your key binds and change it, it actually changes the illumination of those individual keys. So what I thought to be extremely gimmicky actually turned out to be something that helped me with the game because I obviously don't get that much time to play games, but it was really cool to actually see which buttons I could press and which would actually do something in the game. So really cool innovation coming out there and good work to, or good work from MSI and Ubisoft for MSI Mystic Light Sync. We're at that stage where we conclude. So I wanna get the negatives out of the way first and that the only real negatives here, or well, the only real negative is the dim stiffness, which maybe is just something that happened with my board. Please, in the comments, if you do have the board, let me know if you experienced the same thing. However, the things that I would like to see changed is I would like to see at least one NVMe 5.0. Personally, I would like to see Thunderbolt coming into the board, but at the very least change that frontal to a 2x2. Overall, the board is really, really good and it performs, as you saw in performance, it performed phenomenally well. Now, moving on to the price, when this board released initially, it was 11999, which I thought is quite a steep price. Then we saw a price drop to 9999, but I think that this board would be best priced at 8999 in my opinion. And that is because over the years, obviously there's gonna be an increase in price with regards to Z490 to Z590 to now Z690, as well as, yes, there are issues going on in the world with regards to stock shortage and the cost of components. So that is something a little bit above my pay grade, but I do think 8999 would be the perfect spot for this board. Guys, I really hope you enjoyed this review. Please comment in in the comment section below as to if you have this board and what your experiences are. Otherwise, have an awesome time wherever you are. Cheers and goodbye.